Our unison reading comes from Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. But before we turn to God's word, let us turn to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we do give you thanks for the gift of your living word. We pray, O Lord, that you would allow us, by your grace, to hear your word and to apply your word to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. So let us read together. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The lectionary committee leaves out a very important verse in this passage they assigned us for today. They prescribed reading only goes through verse 16. But verse 17 ties in with verse 3, and verse 17 helps make sense of verse 3, and we get a richer, fuller understanding of Abraham if we were read both verses. For that reason, we'll read verse 17, and I even included through verse 22. Shh, don't tell the committee. From Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, God, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be an ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, she shall not be called Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her, I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, No. But your wife, Sarah, shall bear a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. 
As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will bless him and make a fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. The word of the Lord. So Abraham does twice something we rarely do, especially in worship. He falls on his face before God. The first time in awe that that he thinks God would think him worthy of such an amazing promise God speaks directly to him and establishes his covenant as we're looking at God's covenant over these next few weeks, that Abraham would be a father of nations and Abraham fell on his face before God in awe and wonder. Of course, the second time he fell, he was laughing at God's prediction that Sarah's gonna have a baby at 90 and Abraham at 100. But he's not laughing in joy, I don't think. I I think he's laughing in, in disbelief. It's it's almost like it's derision. God's promise is so outrageous. Can it really be believed? It's it's ludicrous. He he cannot believe what God just told him. And and Sarah laughs. She's going to have a baby, and Medicare's going to pay for it. But then again, it says, Abraham trusted God. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans 4, 8, that Abraham hoped against hope that the message was true. And Abraham moved forward in faith with God and did as God said. He trusted, and and, and so he obeyed. Are God's promises to us any sometimes less ludicrous, it seems, than what he promised Abraham? Is it ludicrous that God promises to forgive our sins when we can't forgive ourselves and and struggle to forgive each other? Is it ludicrous that God reconciled himself to us and us to him by giving us the gift of Jesus Christ and anyone who believes in Jesus is a new creation? The old is gone, the new has come. We have a fresh start. Is it ludicrous to believe that we can love and pray for our enemies, our opponents, when the world seems so divided and unwilling to get along and all we can do is cast names at each other? Is it ludicrous that God promised to us that the death is not the end, that we'll be raised from the dead and have life everlasting in his name? And is it possible to think that we will live in God's kingdom forever, even as we live in it now through Jesus Christ? That we'll be raised from the dead and given life everlasting in that eternal kingdom? Is it possible to believe that we live in God's kingdom forever and we will know Jesus in his, all of his glory and be with the communion of saints of all those who've gone before us and we'll know them? And we'll have everlasting joy and laughter with them. Never again will we say bye. We'll only be saying hello as we greet one another in the holy city. Is is it unbelievable or have you found it true that God helps us in all of our circumstances? And we can change our old habits, our old ways, and have a better life by following him. We may not roll on the floor and laugh like Abraham did, but if we don't live out that faith, if if we don't give, if if we don't love one another, if we refuse to forgive one another, and don't even make an effort to forgive, if, if we don't push ourselves to grow and develop and mature in Christ, if we don't let God work in us as he promises to do so, are we not showing doubt as Abraham did? Biology textbooks say a 90-year-old woman can't have a baby. But God showed Abraham God can do anything. It took faith to trust what God told Abraham. 
But then we have enough faith to trust God's promises and provisions, and great things can happen when we trust and obey. We have faith to believe that God is at work in our world, so all is not lost. Things can change for the better. We have faith to believe that the resurrection means there's life after this life. And we have faith to believe that forgiveness brings a new start and new possibilities. And we have faith to believe that people can change. Therefore, reconciliation and peace are possible. It takes faith to do great things. But for God, nothing is impossible. So let us choose faith, let us choose to trust, let us choose to hope and not to despair in life because God is with us, at work in us. And when we open ourselves to God's grace and mercy and peace, great things happen. God's promises are wonderful, they are real, they are trustworthy. And may we be so filled with awe and wonder, even as Abraham was, that Sometimes we do fall on our face and just say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. I don't know what I did to deserve this, but thank you, Lord. Sometimes we're just overwhelmed by God's presence and laughter. Not at us, but with us. Though old, say Abraham and Sarah, will not be on usefulness to God, and what God needed, they had faith. And and that kind of faith is a forward-looking, dynamic relationship with God that helps things get done. Faith is not just sitting on your hands waiting for God to do something, waiting for God to perform some miracle and change this for me. It's a matter of movement and engagement and working with God, seeking what I can do for you, God, reaching out for a miracle, believing that great things do happen. It's a matter of obedience to God's commands and knowing that that makes a difference. Jesus needs people who will obey his instructions to love and to serve and to give and to attempt new things. It is risky, this moving out. And sometimes it means pursuing a lofty goal. But faith has a positive outlook and it's willing to trust God and heed God's commandments. And people with faith like Abraham achieve great things in our world. They open our eyes to see things we couldn't have imagined. They enlarge our horizons. They do things and they champion our causes and they move humanity forward. They inspire the rest of us. Presbyterian pastor Stephen Jansen tells about Sir Alexander Fleming, Scottish physician, microbiologist, won the Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize for medicine when he discovered, you remember what? Penicillin. You recall he made his, his discovery by accident. One day he happened to notice that the fungus on a certain glass plate had died when it came in contact with some mold on the same plate. And he was a forward-thinking, positive person who followed up on his observations that most people would have noticed, well, it's dead, wash it off. But curious, he took a bit of the mold and he cultured it for further study. And on his back, 1928, came penicillin, most widely used antibiotic in the world. The result, Alexander Fleming found a way to treat formerly severe and life-threatening illnesses like pneumonia and meningitis. And one observer commented that what impressed him about Fleming was that he acted immediately on his observation. Most of us, when we see something unusual, kind of go, well, that's interesting. He acted, he explored, he followed up. What can we do with this? We need to let God show us how to see the world's difficulties differently so that we might know what we can do about them to solve them, to overcome them, to help other people. People who trust God enough to take a leap of faith are the doers in this world. They're the achievers. They they enlarge our horizons, and they make new things possible, and they inspire us to attempt new things. They help us to achieve things we didn't think possible. You remember the story of stone soup? Once upon a time, there was a poor village of people who were 
did not like to share. They locked their doors. They kept what little food they had to themselves. And one day a monk with an empty pot and a ladle in his knapsack passed through town, and he was asking people for something to eat. Do you have something to eat? And they would lock the doors. They'd chase him away. And time after time, he was ignored, sent away empty-handed. And in response, he announces to the villagers that he will host a feast for supper, and he's going to serve the most amazing meal, stone soup. And the people laughed. <laughs> you can't make soup out of a stone. Oh, yes, you can. I've done it before. It's delicious. So come to supper tonight. We'll have a feast. Curious, the villagers start to gather in the village square as the monk starts the fire, puts his rock in it, his stone in it, fills it with water, and then he takes out of his bag the, the stone and puts it carefully in the simmering pot, and after stirring for a while, he takes a sip. Oh, it's good, but it's not quite ready. Why not, somebody asked. Well, you know, it needs a pinch of salt or pepper, and I, seem, I haven't brought any in my knapsack. Oh, I've got some. They ran to the house and brought back the salt and the pepper. Man coming home has carrots, potatoes in his hand. What are y'all making? Stone soup. <laughs> stone soup. You can't make anything out of stone soup. Oh, yes, it's delicious. It's almost ready, but you know, what it really needs are some carrots and potatoes. It would be nice if we had some carrots and potatoes. And also hungry, the husband then says, well, yeah, cut them up, put them in. Soon the aroma starts attracting other people. When the monk gave another test, oh, it's almost done. But you, you know what would make this really good? Sliced onions. Sliced onions. Oh, I've, I've got some onions in my house. Could we have? Sure. They bring back, cut up the onions, put them in. Of course, this routine repeats itself on and on. People asking, oh, you know, if it just had some chicken and some broth. Oh, if it just had some garlic, maybe a little turnips, maybe some beans, vegetables start to appear until the, the pot is filled to the brim with a feast and people are just licking their lips with anticipation. And they set up a large table in the middle of the village square and soon you know, bowls and spoons start appearing from the houses to come to the common table. And one by one, the villagers' bowls are filled by the monk out of his ladle, and they sit together and enjoy this meal and laugh and tell stories. And there's camaraderie about this amazing stone soup. And when the meal is done, the villagers ask, do you know where we can get a magic stone like that? Because surely this one's been used up. And the monk shook his head, and he reaches in the pot with a rag and pulls out the stone still whole and complete. And of course, they realize the meal didn't come from the stone. And the monk drank the leftover soup, and they went on his journey. And from that day on, the villagers shared what they had. And no one went without, and the village became a happy place. Consider again God's promise in verse 17, Genesis 17, to make Abraham and Sarah parents of a multitude of nations, of descendants as grains on the sands of the seashore, and all of them loyal unto God. <laughs> Impossible. Oh, no. But there are problems with his claim. Abraham's 99, Sarah's 90. And God speaks of a feast of nations. One preacher remarks, Sarah and Abraham knew very well their pot was empty. But they have faith. They trust God for what seems impossible. And we're told that their faith was the very reason God chooses them as the father and mother of many nations. And God tells Abraham he'll be a father of an ancestor of multitude of nations. And little do they know that several generations down the lineage will come the suffering servant, the one who, according to the prophet Isaiah, will bring forth justice to the nations and pre the prince of peace. Their descendant, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. 
who will renew and fulfill God's covenant promise. So preacher Paul Rook reminds us that as you read Abraham and Sarah's story, they do some awful things to their family. They, they tell big lies when it suits them. They're faithful, but they're also selfish at times. And at times they despair, just like we do. But when God is looking to do something new, he writes, to birth a new people who will bear God's, God's mark and do God's will, and through whom nations will be blessed, more than any of Abraham and Sarah's characteristics, God chose their barrenness to reveal God's miracle and power. And he concludes, an empty pot is an opportunity for God to fill us up, perhaps with the others in our community. You ever feel empty? Feel like you have nothing to offer? That everybody's more talented and more useful to God? that your pot is empty, bare. Such pain can be really humbling and leave us empty, but, but maybe that's not the worst place to be because you're not alone and because God is known to speak to and use barren vessels and out of them to serve a feast of grace and hope and joy. I think Rook is right. And so you have to ask, are, are you ever keeping God at a distance? Are you reluctant to trust like Abraham trusted beyond reason, beyond any shadow of a doubt? Well, then I invite you to experience an exhilarating new adventure, to take a leap of faith with God. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and let Him fill you up and let the Spirit work in you to bring newness and purpose and promise. And like Abraham hoping against hope that the message is an eternal covenant is true, that's the kind of faith that can turn the world upside down and bring joy to you and to others and to God. So I challenge you to serve the Lord your God and bring God great laughter. Amen and amen. <laughs> oh, thank you, God, for your promises that are too good to be true. But you are always true, so we will trust and obey to the glory of your name. It's all that easy, but all that hard. So we thank you for your help, O oh God, to the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen.